Hello everybody. Today in our series of lectures on basic electronics learning by doing, we will go further. Before we do that, let us quickly recollect what we did during the last lecture. You might remember we discussed about the characteristics of a transistor specifically in common emitter configuration and we also discussed some of the biasing schemes like the emitter biasing, voltage divider biasing, etc. and we tried to do some simple numerical examples, problems based on the biasing concepts. Today let us move on to the using the transistors in amplifiers which is one of the major applications of these devices. So before we do that let us perhaps try to find out some characteristics of an amplifier in general before uh, instead of looking at any specific device let us look at what all the important characteristics of an amplifier in general. So what is an amplifier? An amplifier as you can see on the screen is a device which has got an input and an output. Now if I give a small sinusoidal signal as is shown in the figure with an amplitude Vi at the input, you get a magnified version of the same sine wave at the output V0. So an amplifier is basically a device which magnifies or amplifies AC signals, alternating signals impin, uh, uh, given at the input and you get a magnified version of the same signal at the output. We expect the output should be exact reproduction, faithful reproduction of whatever that you have given at the input. So, what are the characteristics? I have again shown an amplifier with two terminals on the left side which are called the input terminals and two other terminals on the other side, on the right side which corresponds to the output terminals. And we have also designated the various voltages and currents. The input voltage is called Vi and the current corresponding to that is called Ii flowing through the input terminal and there is an associated resistance or impedance associated with the input stage of an amplifier. That is if I look, if I stand here and look inside the amplifier, what will be the impedance offered by the device irrespective of what circuits that we have here. So it is equivalent to looking at the Thevenin's equivalent resistance of this amplifier across this terminal. So that is what we call input resistance or input impedance in general. Similarly at the output you have a VO which is the output voltage and there is an IO which is designated with the positive corresponding to current flowing into the amplifier from the output terminal and there is also an associated impedance which is called the output impedance similar to the input impedance on the input side. So the Z0 is an input output impedance and it, you can also consider an R0 the output resistance if uh, the, you are not looking at the uh, general situation of a impedance. So this is a general block diagram of an amplifier and one of the important characteristics of the amplifier is the gain which is defined here. Gain A is defined as V0 V divided by Vi. V0 is a voltage at the output, Vi is a voltage given at the input. The ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage is what is called the gain. In any good amplifier, we should have reasonably large gain. Therefore, the gain in general should be large. Then the other characteristics is the input impedance or the resistance that I already mentioned to you. We can, I have shown it in the form of Ri and this also in general should be very large for an amplifier. 
why should this input resistance be large for an amplifier? You can easily understand this because when I apply a signal here using a signal source, a sinusoidal or any other from a microphone or whatever, you know that source will always have a corresponding source impedance, the internal resistance of the source. So, I, if I want to show the source connected at the input terminal, I will show a voltage source which is corresponding to the signal amplitude and a resistance in series which is corresponding to the internal impedance or resistance of the source. So, that comes in series with the internal resistance or the impedance of the amplifier and therefore, the voltage signal that is applied is now going to be divided between two resistors, one is the source resistance, the other is the input resistance of the amplifier and therefore, whenever two resistances come in series, you know the voltage will be divided. Therefore, my signal, even though I have a signal corresponding to let us say Vs, when it is applied to the amplifier, the Vi which is the signal applied at the terminals of the amplifier you would find will be different from Vs. It will most probably be less than Vs because you have a finite Rs, the source resistance in series with the Zi. We have seen similar situations in other circuits when we discussed and therefore, if I want the entire signal Vs that I apply should be applied across the amplifier terminal, then this is possible only if Rs becomes 0, we all know that. But Rs is not in our hands, Rs is the internal resistance or impedance of a given source. It can be a microphone, it can be a function generator, it can be a signal generator, whatever. And therefore, we have no control on that. So, what we can control is in the design of the amplifier, we can try to make an Zi or an Ri resistance, input resistance of the amplifier. We would like to make it as large as possible, so that any source resistance that comes along with the signal will become very, very small in comparison to the input resistance of the amplifier. That way, I would reasonably make sure that most of the signal Vs will be across applied across the signal and therefore, Vy, Vi will almost be equal to Vs if I ensure the input resistance of the amplifier is very, very large. That is why one of the reason why we must always try to have input resistance of an amplifier, especially voltage amplifier as large as possible. Okay, what about the output resistance or the output impedance? The output resistance should in general be very small. That is again because after you amplify, you have to apply the output voltage to a load. The load that I talk about here could be a simple resistance or it could be a loudspeaker or it could be any other amplifier for example. So, whatever it is, you can also look at it as an equivalent resistance here or L the load resistance. So, when I connect a load resistance, I must make sure that the entire voltage is applied across the load. There is nothing which will be lost due to the internal resistance of the amplifier output stage. Therefore, I will try to make the internal resistance of the output stage to be very, very small, so that the entire output voltage is applied across the load in a very similar argument and therefore, you would find you should have amplifier, good amplifiers will have output resistance very, very small, input resistance very, very large. Ideally, it should be infinity and this should be 0. Then there are several characteristics which are important in any amplifier, but I have listed very important considerations and the fourth one what we want to look at is what is known as the bandwidth what is the bandwidth? It is actually the frequency response of the amplifier. Amplifiers are meant to amplify AC signal. AC signal is characterized by a very specific amplitude and a specific frequency. So, if I take for example, a simple public address system, you know when I speak, 
the sound produces several frequency components. So, therefore, my amplifier should be able to amplify all the frequency components which form the part of my speech without any distortion, any change at the output. And therefore, my amplifier should have a reasonable bandwidth. That means, it should treat equally several ranges of frequencies at the input. That is how good an amplifier is able to amplify signals belonging to different frequency ranges is known by the factor called bandwidth or the frequency response of the amplifier. You can immediately imagine that no amplifier can have infinite bandwidth. That means, it cannot amplify all signals from very low frequencies of the few hertz to very high frequencies in megahertz and gigahertz. So, you should you will always have a finite bandwidth for a given amplifier. If for example, it is an audio amplifier, an amplifier which is made use of to amplify audio frequencies, then you know the audio frequencies range from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. And therefore, I should make sure that my amplifier is capable of amplifying all frequencies equally well starting from some few tens of hertz to 20,000 or more. Then you would see that this will be a very good audio amplifier. Similarly, when I look for higher frequencies, then I should make sure my amplifier also has got a larger bandwidth covering maybe megahertz or things like that. So, one has to be very careful in designing amplifiers for any specific purpose, we must make sure that the amplifier has got the required bandwidth to or the frequency response to amplify the input signals belonging to different frequencies. How do we measure bandwidth? So, for that we have to plot for a given amplifier what is known as the frequency response curve. That means, the frequency versus the bandwidth, the gain. You can see in the next screen, a figure is shown. On the y axis, I have got voltage gain. On the x axis, I have the frequencies, but it is in the logarithmic scale. Because you know, frequencies can go from few hertz to several thousands of hertz. Therefore, if you want to represent all the frequencies within a short distance, then you have to go for a logarithmic scale, which is in powers of 10 or whatever. And therefore, you find here the frequencies on the x axis in logarithmic scale and the voltage gain is on the y axis. And what I have drawn here in the form of a curve is actually the frequency response of a typical audio amplifier or whatever amplifier. That means, at low frequencies somewhere here, the gain is this much. So, if I keep increasing the frequency, the gain slowly increases and quickly comes to a constant value and remains constant over very large decades for several hundreds and thousands of frequencies. And then at the extreme end, at very high frequencies, again it starts falling due to several reasons and then it comes to a very low value. Now, if I have a graph like this, then how do I fix my range corresponding to the bandwidth of the amplifier? So, that is I have shown here to be 0 0.707 times the gain at the mid frequency for an voltage amplifier, but let us try to understand how do we come about with this number. So, in general, our ears are sensitive to logarithmic scale of amplitude or intensity. And therefore, that is the reason this frequencies, uh, the gain also in general will be represented in logarithmic scale as it is called a board plot, the log log plot, log of gain with log of frequency. So, if I have a fall in the power output of an amplifier by nearly half, then perhaps I will not be able to recognize it well. And therefore, the 
point at which I would like to fix my starting point of my bandwidth would be a point corresponding to which the power falls by one half of what it would be at the middle frequencies where it is almost constant. So, with reference to this middle frequencies when the gain falls by nearly half the power gain that is what is important that is the point where I would like to fix my starting point of my bandwidth consideration. So, for that the unit of the power sound power or audio power is in terms of bell B E L L and bell you know comes from the famous Alexander Graham Bell the man who invented the telephones. In honor of him the unit of power is kept and now because that is a small number you want to have a larger number that is called decibel. So, the gain A in decibel unit is 10 times logarithmic to the base 10 of power output by power input. So, this is the definition of 1 dB or 1 decibel. Now, when the power is one half power output is one half the input power then if you find out what is the logarithm 10 log 10 of half you would find that will be minus 3 dB. So, when the power goes below minus 3 dB we will know that the power has really halved it has gone below half and therefore, that point is chosen as the reference point for the bandwidth on the left side as well as on the right side. So, it is called also half power point. So, this point cutoff point F1 and F2 which is defining the bandwidth. The bandwidth is given by F2 minus F1. F2 is a higher frequency, F1 is a lower frequency. F2 minus F1 gives me the bandwidth of the amplifier. So, the F1 point is chosen corresponding to the 3 dB point or in terms of power gain or as the half power point. But we are now discussing here the voltage gain. Therefore, if you consider the voltage ratio or the voltage gain, then you know power is related to voltage as V square by R. Power is proportional to V square by R where V is the voltage and therefore, I must now have a square or if I want to look at V O by V I you know it is going to be 1 by root 2 V O by V i will be 1 by root 2. So, the voltage gain therefore, will be corresponding to 1 by root 2 and if you calculate what is 1 by root 2 you would find it is 0 0.707. So, 0 0.707 times the mid frequency gain when I get I will mark that point as a cutoff point for the frequency or the F1 or F2 depending upon where I mark the point. So, the bandwidth is therefore defined as the point at which the voltage gain drops to about 0.7 times the mid frequency gain and from that I will be able to get the bandwidth. Now, once you know the bandwidth let us try to find out how do we get the other characteristics of an amplifier in general. For example, on the screen let us look at input resistance. I have an amplifier, I have a source and I can introduce a resistance or sense deliberately or it could be the resistance corresponding to the uh, <coughs> the source resistance it can be, but it is always useful to introduce deliberately a resistance here if you want to know what is the input resistance, if you want to measure the input resistance. You we should not in general make use of a multimeter or something, we will not be able to measure using a multimeter uh, ohm, ohm meter in the ohms range for measuring the input resistance of an amplifier. So, I have here a resistance introduced which is called R sense in series with the signal and now what is the input current? The input current is the voltage V s which is the applied signal voltage minus V i which is the actual voltage appearing across the amplifier 
that is the voltage that is available across this resistance and therefore, the difference in the two will be responsible for the current through the resistance. So, V s minus V i divided by the R sense will give me the current by simple Ohm's law. The voltage difference, the potential difference divided by the resistance gives me the current according to Ohm's law. So, V s minus V i by R sense gives me the current. So, I can measure the input current by simply introducing one known resistance and finding out what is the voltage across this resistance. Divide that by the resistance, you will get the input current. And the input impedance or the resistance is measured as the voltage at the input V i measured using again a multimeter divided by the I i measured as explained shortly before. So, E z i is V i by I i. So, this way we will be in a position to measure. In actual practice in the laboratory, you would find this R sense can be kept as a variable resistance and you can vary this till you get V i half of V s. When I get V i half of V s, you know that voltages divide only when the resistances are equal. That means, the R sense should be equal to the input resistance of the amplifier. This will be one of the way this is called the half deflection method you would have used in several applications like measuring the resistance of a mirror galvanometer. You would have used what is known as a half deflection technique. You have zero resistance and obtain a deflection, then you start introducing resistance in the circuit till the deflection becomes half, then you know the resistance of the meter is equal to the resistance that you have included now in the circuit and thereby you can measure the rest. The very simple similar principle is used here to measure the input resistance. Even usually the input resistance of any amplifier will be very large these days several mega ohms and therefore, it will be very difficult to get resistances in the order of mega ohm very precise values and therefore, it is not a bad idea to use any resistance and measure the voltage across them and divide by the resistance and thereby find the current know the input voltage applied and divide the two you will get what is the input resistance of the amplifier. Right. <coughs> so, this I already mentioned to you and now what about the output resistance? When I want to measure the output resistance I will do a very similar scheme. So, you have V minus V naught that is I will again put a output sense, I will short the input and at the output I will put the signal source and I will put a sense and apply the signal. So, V minus V output is the voltage across R sense. So, V minus V naught by R sense gives me the output current I naught flowing into that. So, E z output is equal to V naught divided by I naught by Ohm's law. So, I will be able to measure the output impedance or resistance of an amplifier. Now, I have given here a very simple example to show the effect of input resistance on the signals that I already mentioned to you why the input resistance of an amplifier should be very large. Now, I have here a signal source which has got a 10 millivolt amplitude signal coming and the R source or the sense that I use is about 600 ohms and the input resistance is 1.2 kilo ohms. Now, therefore, now we have to find out what is the actual voltage which will appear across the input terminals of the amplifier. You know the voltage source V s is now going to be divided by two resistors coming in series. One is the source resistance R s which is in general usually be around 600 ohms and the input resistance of the amplifier which is given in this case to be 1.2 kilo ohms. So, the 600 ohms and 1.2 kilo ohms will divide the 10 millivolt in the ratio of their values resistors and therefore, V i will be the one corresponding to E z i, E z i into the current which is V s divided by E z i plus R source. So, this will be the voltage developed across the E z i which is the actual input voltage. So, if you substitute the values 1.2 kilo ohm for E z i 10 millivolt signal strength and 1.2 kilo ohm plus 0.6 kilo ohm 600 ohms is written as 0.6 kilo ohms and if you simplify it is around 6.67 millivolt 
that means you can see even though apply 10 millivolt only 6.67 millivolt is applied across the amplifier because of the existence of the source resistance which is reasonably a very high value in relation to the input resistance which is 1.2 kilo ohm it is actually half of the input resistance and therefore you can see even though you apply 10 millivolt only 6.67 millivolts is applied across the amplifier okay now apart from input resistance output resistance the voltage gain we already defined av as the output voltage by the input voltage now this you can do under condition of no load at the output so we have not connected any load that is it is open circuit under that condition v output by v input with rl is equal to infinity open circuit is the gain v a v n l this is the gain under no load condition this is the general gain a v so you can see now v i as we have already seen is z i v s divided by z i plus z s which we have seen and v i by v s is z i by z i plus z s from this if i bring that v s on the to the left side it will become v i by v s is equal to z i by z i plus z r s and the voltage gain a v is v output by the v input signal v s and that is v i by v s into v naught by v i so that v i and v i will go you will get v o by v s but v i by v s we already got is z i by z i plus r s and v o by v i is the voltage under no load condition therefore voltage gain a v in general is given by z i by z i plus r s into the amplification under no load condition so you can see you will get maximum gain corresponding to no load but the moment you start connecting the load the gain will decrease that is what you understand from this then there is also what is known as a current gain in some devices in some amplifiers you can also get a current gain the current gain ai is defined as the output current divided by the input current so the input current is given by the input voltage divided by the input resistance and the output current is divided by the output voltage divided by the load load or resistance and therefore the output current gain ai will be given as minus av z i by z all if i divide the i o by i i in this case you would find it will be v not by v i which is nothing but av the voltage gain into z i by r l and that that is the input resistance and the load resistance there is a negative sign the negative sign shows that there is a change in the phase there is a current coming out instead of going in i not is positive when it goes into the terminals of the output and therefore there is a negative sign corresponding to this having learned some basic characteristics of the amplifier let us move on to look at one simple configuration of a common emitter amplifier which we have already seen in the earlier situation when we looked at the uh, biasing circuits you can see it has got the voltage divider bias with the emitter resistance re you have an rc here you have the coupling capacitor c1 and c2 which will block the dc coming from the other stages and you have a c3 which is called the bypass so that as far as the ac is concerned the emitter is at the ground potential so that is the function of the c3 so there is a signal source applied vs along with the series source resistance rs so now i want to analyze this and try to obtain the different parameters or characteristics of this amplifier like what is its input resistance looking from the input side this is the input side from here what is the input resistance from here what is the output resistance and what is the current gain what is the voltage gain etc so how do we go about analyzing this simple circuit the first thing that we should remember is now we are trying to look at the performance of the circuit under ac situation we are going to apply an alternating voltage so what happens to that that is what is of great importance to us immediately and therefore i must look at the ac equivalent circuit of this circuit that i have drawn 
If I want to look at the AC equivalent circuit, you know what we have to do? The DC source is not going to be there. That means I must short the DC sources. So the plus PCC and the minus ground here will be together. It will be folded and connected to the ground as far as the AC is concerned. So which is equivalent to saying the two resistors R1 and RC are now grounded as far as the AC is concerned because this was the previously the VCC. Now because we are looking at AC equivalent, this is ground. Anyway, R2 is already in the ground potential, emitter is in the ground potential because you have put a capacitor there. That capacitor will become a lower resistance path for AC and therefore this is a shark here. So this becomes the equivalent circuit. Now we can bring down all down so that it is more convenient to look at them. Then you find what I have got is the equivalent circuit of the whole amplifier that we saw. R1, R2 are now in parallel and therefore this Rb, the base resistance is actually the parallel value of R1 and R2 and you have Rc coming here which was the collector resistance because of the AC equivalence it has come to the ground. Now this is a transistor, I must try to have some equivalent circuit corresponding to the transistor here and you see the capacitors are all missing. The coupling capacitor C1 and C2 are also missing because they will become short for the AC signals, for the operating signals that we are the frequencies of uh, interest, they will become almost a short and therefore I have removed them from the circuit by a short. So I, we, this is the AC equivalent circuit. I do still have the source Vs and the Rs in series, but if I want to analyze and obtain complete information about the performance of the amplifier, then you know I must replace this transistor also by some equivalent resistors, capacitors, voltage source, current source, etc. Then you know this whole problem becomes simplified into a simple network that we have already discussed enough in the earlier lectures. So you can find what will be the output voltage, what is the input because it is a series of number of resistors, voltage sources, current sources, etc. We will be in a position to apply the known theorems like Thevenin's theorem, Norton's theorem and things like that and we will be able to apply the concepts that we already learned and understand the various voltages appearing across different terminals. From that we will be able to obtain information regarding the voltage gain, input resistance, output resistance, etc. So the problem now is how to get an equivalent circuit for a transistor. Now let us for simplicity take initially the common base transistor. The common base transistor you can see in the figure is shown like this. This is a emitter and this is a collector and the base is common to both the input and the output. So this is a very simple common base transistor shown in all its uh, complete picture. Now if I want to draw the equivalent circuit of this, then you can imagine as far as the emitter base terminals are concerned, there is going to be the forward junction, emitter base junction. So I can replace the emitter base junction by a simple diode, junction diode. So this is a diode which comes in the emission, emitter base junction and if the reference to the collector, you know whatever is the IE, I get an IC which is alpha times IE where alpha is the current gain for a common base amplifier transistor and the alpha you know IC is almost equal to IE except for a small base current here and therefore alpha is going to be very close to 1, 0.9 or something like that. So the I introduce a current source in the collector circuit which is given by a value alpha IE where alpha is the current gain, IE is the input emitter current. So this you know because alpha is very close to 1, it is almost equal to IE. So that is the one which will flowing out as IC in this direction. So this is a very simple idea of an equivalent circuit for a common base transistor. Now it is still not convenient because we still have a diode, we should try to replace the diode by the equivalent resistance. For that we can look at the general diode equation the diode equation for energy, 
P n junction diode is I d is equal to I s exponential Q v by K t minus 1, where I s is the reverse saturation current, the V is the voltage across the diode and Q is the charge K t, K is the Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature. So, with known values here, this equation if I now differentiate and then obtain d v d by d i d, then it becomes a resistance. That resistance is the equivalent dynamic resistance of the diode R e and that you would find when I substitute the values for the charge q 1.6 into 10 over minus 19 coulomb and k the Boltzmann constant, t the room temperature for example, around 300 Kelvin and I d, I s is going to be very small therefore, I will approximate to I d. Then you would find this will become almost equal to 26 millivolt divided by I d. That will be the resistance of a diode corresponding to a given current I d. So, once we know that now I can replace the resi diode that I have shown in the previous model with a resistance which is whose value is called R e and the R e is nothing but V B e the voltage between the base emitter divided by I e when the V C e is maintained constant and in this case it is going to be 26 millivolt by I e. The 26 millivolt here it is written as 0.026 volts by current that is in ohms. So, R e is 0 0.026 by I e ohms. So, that is the resistance here and this current source is alpha I e. There is a resistance here which is the output resistance which can be easily obtained graphically. If you remember the, the output characteristics of a common base transistor, you would find it will have almost flat response. So, if you look at the resistance, the resistance will be very, very large corresponding to the slope of the curve that you get and therefore, we can almost take it as infinity and therefore, that is not shown here. In principle, there will be an R o here, that R o is very, very large therefore, that is ignored here in this example and therefore, when I look from here, I can get the output resistance. When I look from the emitter base junction into the transistor, I will get the input resistance. You can immediately see when I look from this side, the in resistance that I will be looking at will be R e. So, the Z i is R e in the case of common base amplifier or transistor. Similarly, the Z output, I will be looking into a constant current source, the internal resistance of a constant current source you know is infinitely very large and therefore, Z output is infinite ohms. So, you can see the whole idea becomes very simple now for the common base transistor. V output is nothing but I output into R l, the voltage developed across R l due to the current flowing out of the terminal. There is a negative sign to show that the current is coming out instead of going into the output terminal. So, this is minus minus I c the collector current into R l and I c is alpha times I e that we also know and therefore, the output voltage is given by alpha I e R l. The input voltage is the emitter current multiplied by input resistance that is in emitter current multiplied by R i. In this case, R i is nothing but small r e which is the diode resistance I e into R e which is 26 millivolt by I e. So, that is the current here. So, now therefore, what is V i v? The voltage gain is V output by V input, V output is alpha I e R l divided by I e R e, the I e and the I e will cancel therefore, you will get alpha times R l divided by small r e. Because alpha is almost equal to 1, this will be almost equal to R l by R e. So, the voltage gain of a common base amplifier transistor is R l by R e, where R e is the base resistance due to the diode. What about current gain? Current gain A i is output current divided by input current. The output current is minus I c, the collector current which is flowing out divided by I e and therefore, it is minus alpha because I i is actually the emitter current. The ratio of collector current to the emitter current is what is called alpha, therefore, it is minus alpha and because alpha is nearly equal to 1, it is going to be minus 1. So, the current gain is minus 1. So, this is about common base transistor, but we know 
we are interested more in common emitter amplifier because in common emitter amplifier you get much larger gain. Therefore, let us try to look at the equivalent circuit of a common emitter transistor. So, you can see here in the picture the common emitter transistor shown with the base I B as the input current as against the common base where I E was the input current. So, I B base terminal is the input terminal emitter junction is emitter terminal is a common terminal between the input and output and you have the collector terminal here. So, if I have this then you can see I can form the base emitter junction diode again here as you see in the screen and between the base and the collector I have got the current source which is now beta times I B the current I C is where beta is a very large number in the case of a common emitter amplifier. So, beta times I B where I B is the base current, base current usually will be in micro amperes and the collector current will be in milli amperes that means there will be hundreds of times larger current will be in the I C corresponding to I B and the for beta will be a few hundreds 150, 200 etcetera. So, this is the equivalent circuit of a common emitter transistor. I now replace the diode by the equivalent resistance R E and beta I B is the current source corresponding to the uh, base emitter base collector uh, region and therefore, now let us what is I C? I C is beta times I B we know that. I E is beta plus 1 times I B because there is also an I B there. I B also joined together with I C to form I E therefore, beta plus 1 times I B, but we will neglect the 1. So, I E is almost equal to beta times I B usually I E and I C will be almost equal you know that. Now, what about Z i the input resistance or input impedance V i voltage input divided by the current I E which is in this case uh, uh, current input I i this should be I i. So, it is V B e the voltage between the base and emitter and I B I B is the input current and V i is V B e we know that the input resistor input voltage is nothing but the voltage applied across the base emitter junction V B e that is I e into R e and I B is beta times I B R e this is beta beta times R B R e. The, therefore, Z i input resistance impedance is V B e by I B and beta times I B R e by I B that is beta times R e. Beta is around 150 in a typical case if I take about 150 for beta this B is actually beta symbol R e is around 6 ohms 6 ohms. Then the input resistance is a product of 150 into 6 that is 900 ohms this is nearly, nearly 0.9 k. So, you can immediately see in the case of a common base amplifier the input resistance was very very low whereas, in the case of an in common emitter amplifier you find the input resistance is around 1 or 2 k it is about 1 k in this case 0.9 k. So, it is a larger value. So, let us now look at the common emitter transistor and then try to understand the gain and all that we output in that case is output current multiplied by R L the load resistance and here it is I C therefore, minus I C into R L that is beta times I B R L that is the output voltage. The input voltage V i is minus I i Z i this is minus I that is I B beta R E and therefore, the gain is V output by V i input that is beta times I B R L by I B into beta times R E I B and beta will cancel. So, you will get R L by R E alone it is very similar to what you got in the previous case R L by R E and the minus shown sign shows that the output is 180 degrees out of phase with reference to the input. So, if we look at the current gain A i is output current divided by input current, output current is I C, input current is I B therefore, it is almost equal to beta. So, the current gain is beta, the voltage gain is given by R L by small r e where small r e is the resistance of the base. Now, let us having understood this, let us take a very simple example. 
of a common ammeter amplifier with a value of beta equal to 150 and the IE is 3 milliamperes and the output resistance is almost infinite resistance there and therefore now we have to determine ZI the input resistance or impedance AV the voltage gain for a load of 2 kilo ohms and AI with the same 2 kilo ohm. So find out what is ZI, what is the voltage gain, what is the current gain for the case of common emitter amplifier with a transistor having a beta of 150 and a current IE of 3 milliamperes. So now you know we can get RE first. RE is nothing but 26 millivolt divided by IE and the IE is given in the problem to be 3 milliamperes. So 26 millivolt divided by 3 milliampere gives me 8.67 ohms. So 8.67 ohms is the resistance of the internal diode that you come across between the base and the emitter junctions. The ZI therefore will be beta times RE and beta is given as 150 there 150 times 8.67 ohms and that will be around 1.3 kilo ohm. So the input resistance of a common ammeter amplifier with the specifications shown given is about 1.3 kilo ohm which is reasonably large but not very large. And what is the voltage gain? The voltage gain we know is given by RL by small re where RL is the load resistance and RE is the base emitter junction resistance and that is 2 kilo ohm is RL 8.67 ohms is the uh, input RE resistance and therefore the ratio gives to be comes to be around 230, 231. So the minus sign shows that there is a inversion. We did not get the minus sign in the case of common base amplifier because there the output is in phase with the input whereas here the output will be 180 degrees out of phase with the input that is why you get a minus sign. What about current gain? Current gain is I output by IC and you know that is nothing but beta and therefore current gain is around 150. So what we have now done is we have taken the simple scheme of assuming the transistor to be equated to a diode at the input side and a current source at the output side and when you look at the common emitter configuration you find it will be something like this and just by knowing RE and the current source we will be in a position to find the simple relationship corresponding to the input voltage gain, current gain, input resistance and output resistance. Still we have not discussed anything about the bandwidth because when I want to look at the bandwidth then we have to take into account the frequency dependent resistances in the circuit. We have for the present for the sake of simplicity we have ignored all the capacitors. We have ignored the presence of C1, C2, I will quickly show you the circuit and tell you what I mean by that. In this circuit for example, I did not consider the effect of C1, the effect of C2, the effect of C3. I have assumed that this is a short for the frequency range in which we are looking at the circuit, this will be a short, this will be a short, this will be a short and therefore in my equivalent circuit I never considered the presence of RE. I considered only the emitter connected to the ground. Here also you find this will be just a short here and a short here. But if you want to really look at the frequency response of the common emitter amplifier then we have to take into account the frequency dependent impedances like the reactances of the capacitors and things like that. You would find later on we will have a detailed discussion about the considering the frequency response of any amplifier there you would find 
they will correspond to the low frequency response of the amplifier or the low frequency cutoff will be decided by the combination of these capacitors and the high frequency will be decided by the bypass capacitor. This is called a bypass capacitor because the AC will be bypassed from flowing through RE therefore this is called a bypass capacitor. So the bypass capacitors will decide on the high frequency side and the coupling capacitors will decide on the low frequency side what is the bandwidth. So this is a very simple scheme of analyzing a common base or a common emitter amplifier. Now in the next lecture we would like to consider a more popular method of analyzing transistor amplifier that is by making use of what is known as hybrid model, hybrid parameter, the H parameter scheme of drawing the equivalent circuit of a transistor because if you find the data sheets of many transistors from the manufacturer you would find they will always list out some of the parameters like H11, H12 or HIE, HFE, HRE etc. So we, we must be able to also make use of those parameters if I want to analyze a amplifier, transistor amplifier and therefore the transistor in principle transistor can be looked at in different ways in terms of purely resistive networks then it is called R or Z parameters or you can write a equivalent model for the transistor using only conductances or admittances then it is called a Y parameter or you can have hybrid parameter. Hybrid means you will have some which are voltages, some which are ratio, some which are current ratio, one is some is a input resistance, another is a conductance and things like that. So you will have the parameters will be having different dimensions. Some will be ratios, some will be a ohms, some will be conductance and Siemens and things like that. So if I look at that way that, that model is called a hybrid model. So we can analyze the given transistor using hybrid model also. So we will perhaps take up in the next lecture how to go about considering the transistor as a hybrid equivalent circuit what all the various uh, parameters which will come into the uh, modeling and then we will try to analyze a same circuit using hybrid parameters, H parameters, the input resistance, output resistance etc. And then we will correlate whatever results we get from the hybrid parameter discussion with the corresponding uh, uh, considerations with reference to the uh, RE that we consider today. What we consider today with RE and beta times IC and IB etc. are the simplest way to consider. Therefore, if you are given a amplifier to analyze, you can if you want to do very quickly obtain some reasonable numbers close to the values of the gain, the input resistance and output resistance etc. The RE model is very very useful because it is very simple all that you have to know is what is the current through the IE and then you will find 26 millivolt by IE gives me the resistance RE and then for in the common emitter amplifier the input resistance is beta times RE. Beta is also equivalently in the hybrid parameter corresponds to HFE we will see that and therefore you would find the correlation between the hybrid parameter and the RE parameters also will be highlighted and the simplest way of doing is what we have so far discussed today and in the next lecture we will take up a more rigorous discussion about the H parameters and then we will also apply wherever necessary simplifications or approximations and try to look at the simplest way of analyzing a given circuit in terms of H parameters and then obtain the corresponding quantities like the input resistance, output resistance the voltage gain, the current gain etc. So that, that is a uh, idea and if possible we will also try to uh, construct an amplifier and then measure 
its input resistance, output resistance and things like that and try to see whether we are able to get the value which we obtain from our calculations by actual experimentation. Thank you. Thank you.